One of the things most synonymous with fighting games is the six button controller with the levered arcade stick. It's been part of fighting game culture since the arcades and of course it made its way into our homes in the 1990s. It grew throughout the noughties, exploded with the release of Street Fighter 4 and now it's quite possibly on its way out. The arcade stick is so very, very tied to the history of fighting games and we are here at EVO at the Arcade Stick Museum to take a look at some of the most historic and iconic controllers in fighting game history. Let's start with one of the most iconic fighting game controllers ever, uh, the Mars Stick. The Mars Stick was released uh, in conjunction with the release of Street Fighter 2, it allowed people to take what was essentially an American arcade cabinet setup into their house, which is what everyone wanted, a way to practice and play the games that they loved at home with the release of the home console versions. With the resurgence of arcade fighter titles and their near-perfect home ports in the late 90s and the turn of millennium, the Mastic saw a huge resurgence with the likes of the Marvel vs Capcom 2 and the Capcom vs SNK communities. The price of these sticks almost became an obstacle to entry in the competitive scene. Unfortunately, they were very, very difficult to get hold of. They started reaching incredible resale prices amongst the community as they were so difficult to obtain. The build quality, the components, it had to feel right. It was so important that the players got the authentic experience and it made it so hard to get hold of these sticks. Of course, as console gaming got bigger and bigger and fighting game ports became even more common, uh, there started to become more options and more companies, corporations, in fact, got involved. We saw the release of the Namco stick with uh, Tekken 3, which people were able to use in their homes, and companies like Konami, and then Dreamcast, uh, the famous Green Goblin, released uh, more commercialized sticks that were far easier to get hold of, and these saw huge rises in sales. Corporations like Hori began producing sticks that popularized Japanese components, which were not as well known in America. They favored their concave buttons and back top setups. These ball top levers and far more sensitive buttons proved to be uh, quite alien to a lot of the American arcade goers. But with the amount of support that they had from these corporations, they became more and more and more prevalent. Which brings us to 2008. Street Fighter IV revolutionized fighting games. It brought fighting games back to a level which saw unheard of engagement, growth. Events like EVO became so much bigger off of the back of the release of Street Fighter IV. And the same can be said for the peripherals market. Working for the less than popular peripherals manufacturer Mad Cats, which had a pretty poor reputation at the time. Markman put together this project. In fact, Markman was the man responsible for curating this entire collection. Almost all of these sticks come from his personal collection from his home. He was the man responsible for making the tournament edition Mad Cats arcade fight stick. And this is what changed everything for controllers. You may have seen earlier on in the row the Chun-Li Super Edition of this stick, uh, which was a slightly smaller version. But with the release of the Tournament Edition in North America, it pretty much standardized the use of Japanese components like Sanwa in arcade sticks. And this just gave everyone access to the kind of fight sticks that would be of a professional level, mimicking the Vulix cabinets that people would play Street Fighter 4 on at the time. Mad Cats continued to iterate on their tournament edition popularity with this fight stick, the Versus SE, which was incredibly expensive and had silent components as well, which was uh, quite the novelty. Games like Mortal Kombat got involved with their higher end arcade controllers, which again... Oh, hello. Hi. We have a special guest. I was just telling people how amazing your collection was. Oh, nice, yeah. And how important the work you did on this was, actually. I just, I was just in the neighborhood. I saw you talking and we both like our kids sticks. We do, we do. So we were just talking about how important the TE was for the growth of the peripherals market. At the time, it was pretty niche. Very and this niche. put not only arcade sticks, but Japanese components in our hands of pretty much 
every player at the time. Like, yeah. What was that like? It was interesting because, you know, we had to convince, we had to make a very important decision as Mad Cats. How are we going to create an arcade stick for the future generation of fighting game fans? We know, obviously, with Street Fighter 4 coming out, that was an important decision, and whatever decision we made would kind of be seen as a standard just because it would be officially licensed by Capcom and officially Street Fighter 4. That being said, it was an easy decision for me because I knew that American arcades were dying and more and more people were starting to import arcade sticks from overseas. So we went with the Vulix style layout, the Vulix style arcade controls, and you know, it really changed everything because you know, Japanese arcade sticks weren't easy to get. People had to import and pay hundreds of hundreds of dollars to get them. So we decided why not make a quality style arcade controller that would help people bridge into what this new generation of fighting games are being. And we haven't looked back since. I think since then, more and more companies have gotten into the space, more and more companies have gotten into supporting the players and events. And it's really changed, not just from a control and actual physical goods standpoint, it's changed so much that it's become an industry all in itself. I want to ask you two questions. Uh, yeah. The first about the components, because obviously we talked about earlier the American arcade cabinet standards of the time and how different the more sensitive and ball top controllers from Japan felt to a lot of those players. Yeah. Obviously as a Tekken player as well, you'd have been very familiar with the Korean levers which felt different as well, and their buttons were ever so slightly different. Mm -hmm. So there's three different camps at the time. Like what was that like as well in terms of, you know, how specific were people with these controllers, with their preferences? You know, preference is key, and that's really what it is all about in terms of the community is being able to give people a way where they can customize something towards their liking. You know, it's it's hard at first because you have, you know, decades of American style parts, you have decades of Japanese style parts, and, and that world kind of melding together. And the way that, you know, again, I mentioned earlier that arcade scenes were kind of dying. It was only a matter of time before we kind of figured out more of a standard of what the community would kind of support and what they liked. And that kind of leaned towards the Japanese side of things. So one of the things that we did at Mad Cats, and I think a lot of other companies kind of followed suit, is they made their arcade sticks customizable to the point where they could put in almost any any kind of part that you want. With how American parts were kind of tre trending, it wasn't really the preference of, of what we found out was it wasn't really the preference for a lot of the players anymore. So what we try to do is try to make sure that we could support all the Japanese style parts, but also Korean parts as well. So one of the things you'll see from all the arcade sticks from I would say 2012 afterwards is that not only do they support almost any style Japanese parts, but also Korean parts as well. So unfortunately, the American stick is now like the niche for the for the for the parts. But the thing is there's something for everyone out there. If you really want to have like old school flavor or you want to have something more Korean, it's really easy to kind of figure out what kind of stick you want and the resource and the information is out there. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I wanted to ask you as well. So one of the things that people spoke about in terms of the growth of esports is the ability to bring in sponsors, whether they're endemic or non-endemic, but yeah. peripherals and components are a very big part of that. Yeah. What your time at Mad Cats, you were one of the first companies to actually utilize players as influencers, oh, yeah. sponsor players, put a team together, in fact, under Mad Cats. You know, How did yeah. that work at the time? It did work out in a very fun way because, you know, I actually talked to the CEO at the time and he said, instead of just, you know, supporting events, why don't we also support players? One of the early proponents of that was Ono-san from Capcom. He actually said, hey, why don't you guys sponsor Daigo? He is one of the most popular players in the world. I think it makes sense if you guys started sponsoring players as well. Not only did we sponsor Daigo, we sponsored Mago, Tokido, Ryan Hart. We made a team through Ryan Hart, through Western Wolves, sponsored Infiltration, we sponsored Blaf, so many players at the yeah. time. And really, we started showing that, hey, it's not just about the events, it's, not, it's also about the players, but it influenced companies like Hori, companies like PDP, to also support these players and these events as well. And I think just looking back at it, just kind of taking a, a bigger view at it, what we did at Mad Cats at the time was the right thing because again, it really evolved not only the players, but also the community. Can you show us which one your favorite stick is on this? I know oh, it's going to be very hard. Stick. So my actual, your actual favorite one. My favorite stick is that not even on this wall. So what? This is, this I is, thought you curated this. I did, but it's more of a historical curation. Okay. So the ones on the wall, this yeah. one I has a special place in my heart, the, 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 the T stick, just because it really kind of changed the trajectory of what we were doing with arcade parts at the time. However, if you were to ask me like what my favorite one is in terms of inspiration and reference, it would be this bad boy right here. Sega's Virtua Stick High Grade influenced so many of the sticks. It was, I think, the biggest influence on the TE stick. It also influenced the Versus stick, which you could tell with the shape, but it also influenced the Itoki stick. So many sticks were influenced by that great stick, and I would say that's really one of the most influential sticks of all time. Now, that was one of the first commercially available arcade sticks that was very, very much geared towards the high-end oh, yeah. 
oh, of yeah. that market. Oh yeah. It came at a time, you know, it came at a time where Virtua Fighter 4 first came out, so it was many years ago. I was 2007, if I remember correctly, and it was on a new platform. And one of the things that a lot of people have to remember is when new games come out and when new platforms come out, like for example, when PS4 was new, when PS5 is new, that is the time when people really start to invest in new arcade sticks. So it's very important to have a bespoke design, one that kind of resonates with the community and what that resonates with what a player would want and need. What are the things for you that like make an arcade stick stand? What do you look for as a man that owns almost all of them? I think there's probably single digits left on your to get list. Yeah, there's only like three that I'm missing. Exactly. But I what say, is it that stands out for you in an arcade stick for in terms me, of design? Even the smallest minute detail is a standout for me. And knowing why those changes are, are made, that's enough for me to want to buy it and have it in my collection. There's a lot of reasons why I'm into arcade sticks, but I look at every single one of them as kind of like works of art. I don't want to say it's like individual art pieces, but more like if you look at cars, like there's so many different cars that are out there, yeah. but everyone has a different story behind it. Everyone has a different design methodology. And that's what I love about arcade sticks is there's a use case for almost every single one out there. There's a reason why they design it certain ways, yeah. whether it's for saving costs, whether it's for uh, kind of going towards a certain demographic, there's all kinds of cool design references and design ideas behind them, and I love that. Like, how do you relate your love of sneakers footwear to arcade sticks? Because it seems quite similar to me. It's very similar. You know what's funny? It's it goes hand in hand because you know there'll be those times where we try to get our favorite sneakers, but we yeah. can't get them, and we yeah. get frustrated. And that's when I go back to arcade sticks and I start collecting them. So if it wasn't for sneakers. I wouldn't have gone hard on arcade sticks because arcade sticks at the time were very easy to get. Obviously a little bit more expensive, but it was one of those things like, hey, you know what? I can't get these sneakers I want. I'll spend that money on arcade sticks instead. It was one of those things. And it goes hand in hand, it goes back and forth. It's a, it's a fun battle. All right, I want to ask you because we're going to put this in the video. It's quite important. Yeah. I think it's very poignant right now where I stand here and I look at the history of nearly 30 years of levered controllers and I look out ahead and I see the hitbox stand looking straight at us as if it's walking past uh, a memorial almost of levered controllers yeah. or arcade sticks. As we see, you know, even Daigo has now uh, been sponsored by Hitbox after playing on a leverless controller yeah. for many years now. Do you feel like the time is over for, for levered controllers? Definitely not. The majority of the players still play on arcade sticks when, when it comes to not using the control pad, right? The thing is, the, the, the beauty is out there that people can find what works best for them. Mm -hmm. And I think the ev evolution of these players to be able to play faster, play smarter, play more accurately, that is the most important thing. And whether it's things like the cross-up where it's the best of both worlds, where it's a lever and button controls, or if it's purely button controls, that's what I want to see what works best for each player. Because even if you ask like some of the best players, Daigo and Tokido that use these leverless controllers now, they also mentioned like, hey, I can't use Dragon Punch characters on this. I would prefer using an arcade stick for that. So if there's a way where people can find the comfort zone and marry those styles together and become the more ultimate version of themselves, I'm all about it. And I want to see that. Whether it's lever, without lever, with, with mind control, I don't care. <laughs> I think we're a little away from mind control being yeah. legal at Evo, but... I'll make it happen. I'm a hardware whiz. Thank you so much for talking to us, man. I appreciate it. And what a beautiful collection. I know it's only a fraction of what you got, uh, but there's so many fraction. historic pieces here. Uh, it's a great piece, man, and so important for the FGC to be able to come out and, and appreciate all of this. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. A number of other companies got into the game after the success of Mad Cats pulling ahead in the controller peripherals market. It was so popular uh, that many more had to get involved. Razer, the internationally renowned uh, PC and peripherals company, got into the game with the Aatrox in 2012, which infamously malfunctioned uh, at grand finals of EVO that year. They got back in the game with the Pantera, which is recognized as one of the best sticks, so it worked out well for them. Quamba have been involved in arcade sticks for a number of years, but with the release of their Obsidian, which is almost the spiritual successor to the tournament edition Mad Cats in the layout and the size of the stability, the look of it, the customization ability of it, it is very much the modern equivalent of that T, and it has seen Quamba catapult to the forefront of the arcade stick game now here in 2022. Companies like Victrix uh, with their Victrix Pro FS looking for a premium market, their brushed metal finish, their laser etched quality certainly gave people uh, an alternative at that higher price point as well. And then the Hori Fighting Edge, another high-end arcade stick from the company that has been so consistent, Hori, throughout the years with the h wrap This stick actually uses a lot of their own components rather than utilizing Sanwa and Saimetsu 
Uh, Hori have their own levers and their own buttons, which some people do prefer. Of course, when you look at arcade sticks as collectibles, when you look at arcade sticks as things of status, where people are customizing them, they're making them their own, they're making them almost unobtainable. The most unobtainable of fight sticks would be these here. So this is the Mad Cats Evo Fight Stick Tournament Edition Gold, which was awarded to the top eight placers in the 2010 Evo Tournament. And of course, it doesn't get any rarer than this. They repeated that again with uh, their updated TE2. And then this year, let's take a look at the stick that will be awarded to the top eight placers at Evo 2022. The Vitrix Pro FS Gold is going to be awarded to the top places of main EVO 2022 titles. And this continues the legacy of previous gold trophy editions of the arcade stick. It retains the brushed metal finish, but you can see the chrome components there, the EVO laser etch. It is truly a prize worthy of champions, the best players in the world. And it's a beautiful piece. I would love to own one. I'm never going to get my hands on one without trying to steal this. So. Let me make sure that no one's looking and I'll be back in a minute.